Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here and draw water. Jesus said to her, Go. Call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. All of the earth make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your name. Jesus is coming.
will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. And until that day, before you and Lord we know that at any moment you could return and our call and our prayer is even so come quickly Lord Jesus but Lord until that time prepare us and help us to be a people who are kingdom people and help us to be a church that is a kingdom church and Lord I ask you this morning that your spirit would work and speak into our hearts your word and your wisdom and your will today, Lord, that you'd empty me of myself and fill me with your spirit that I might proclaim your truth. To you be the glory both now and throughout all of eternity. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, this morning, as, as we come and as we stand here, we are in a series called Kingdom Focus. And in this series called Kingdom Focus, we're learning what it means, you know, to to walk in relationship to the kingdom of God. Because so oftentimes, one of the the, the vibes I get out of a lot of Christianity is we're not as focused on what God is doing and upon His kingdom as we are upon what's happening in my life and how my needs are being met. Have you ever noticed that? You know, our, our society is, is, seems to, to be really concerned about self and really concerned about self-needs. And, and I, I understand that. You know, we all have needs and we all have wants. We all have desires. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added to you. So he's telling us something about kingdom living. And, and today as we talk about this kingdom focus, you know, last week we talked about uh, kingdom focus and, and, and kingdom people. And today I want to continue that thought, but I want to continue that thought in this way. Kingdom, kingdom focus, the kingdom, but the church. 
And, and Susan just read and, and shared with you from jo- the Gospel of John chapter 4, the story of the woman at Samaria. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Now, Jesus is telling us something that is uh, pretty remarkable here. He says, you, if you believe in me, will do greater works than I do. I'm going to the Father. I'm empowering you. Something's going on, and God is working in people who will in turn make up his church. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, he called us to believe upon him, but what does it mean exactly to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that something like, you know, believing, you know, in Santa Claus, or do you believe in aliens? But the the question is, do you believe in Jesus? And it's asking more than do you believe that Jesus Christ existed or exists? That, you know, that's not, the, the, the true meaning of the question is, is do you believe that Jesus Christ is who the Bible says that he is? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is who the Bible said that he is, and are you trusting him as your Savior? Now, what does the Bible say about who he is? The Bible tells us that he is the Word become flesh. I love the opening statement in the Gospel of John. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of God. And the Word uh, dwelt there, and, or, or the word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and, and we beheld his glory. That's what the Scripture says. And, and he became the penalty bearer. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes and says this. He says, For I delivered you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, if that's first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that first importance has nothing to do with what I want, right? You know, how my life is living out and what's being provided here and provided there. It has to do with what God has done on on my behalf to bring me into His kingdom. Then Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians and says, For our sake He made Him, that is God, made Him, that is Jesus, to be sin." Who knew no sin? He was perfect. He was righteous. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, there's a great exchange that takes place when we come to trust Jesus. He takes on our sin. We take on his righteousness. Because, you know, we deserve death. Paul wrote to the Romans and said, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord. And this sacrifice of Jesus, God's incarnate Son, is the only adequate payment for our sin. The Scripture says, John writes, He is the propitiation for our sins, not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And Jesus said, you know, I I tell you something. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You know, there's a lot of paths that people proclaim. Some people, they think, man, if I'm just really good enough, I'll be acceptable to the Father. You know, uh, the Beatles, uh, you know, had a song about uh, trusting in Hare Krishna. And uh, Hare Krishna was it. Some people, you know, they, they go to Buddha. You know, I, I talk to people of Islam, and I say, will you go to heaven one day? And they say, we don't know. It's up to Allah. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. But what he's actually saying here is everyone can come to the Father through him as we put our hope and our faith and our trust in him. So what does it really mean? What does that kind of biblical faith look like? Biblical saving faith is trusting, believing, relying upon on those facts. Now, when you came into this place of worship today, you may have noticed we don't have pews. Anybody notice that? Now, y'all got to help me out here because Matt sang too long. No, we had a lot packed in. We were excited as we were praying about how God was directing us to this service this week. But, you know, we don't have pews, right? Now, how many of you grew up in a church with pews? Look at there, all of us. And, And remember, those pews didn't always have cushions. You know, my home church was uncushioned. I mean, you could slide back and forth, you know, on those pews, and your mama could pinch the fire out of your, out of your thigh for moving too much, you know, on Sunday morning. 
But we were sliding back and forth because they were really pretty much like uncomfortable. But you came in here this morning and you said, wow, theater seats. They look comfortable. They look built. They look well put together. And I believe that chair will hold me up and I won't fall to the floor. Now, I don't see anybody sitting on the floor. But you didn't really believe it until you sat in it. In the same regard, you know, you can believe the facts about Jesus, but when the facts about Jesus take effect in your life is when you actually are trusting Him, when you're actually following after Him, when you're actually looking to Him and dependent upon Him to lead you and to guide you, to direct you, and to live in and through you in your life. And, and, uh, and so today, you know, when we talk about the kingdom of God and when we talk about the church, we must first of all understand that that church is made up of a kingdom people who walk in a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. And, and, um, and so when we talk about that kind of relationship, we're really talking about a, a revolution. Here's what a revolution is. A revolution is a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. When Jesus came into our lives, when that conviction of the Spirit of God spoke to us and we said, Lord, I need you, Jesus came in and there was a revolution within us. There was a forcible overthrow of an old government system called the self that Jesus overthrew. And now we became followers of the king. And when we became followers of this king named Jesus, we became subjects of his kingdom. Does all that make sense? So we therefore are kingdom people. So look at that person beside you. Go ahead. Don't turn away and just look at them and say, I are a kingdom person. I are a kingdom person. I, I like to throw in some you know, bad grammar occasionally. I are a, a kingdom per person. That whole R thing came from my my boys, you know, when they were little, they always wanted to go to Toys R Us. Toys R Us, was that the name of it? Toys R Us? What was it? Something like that, whatever. But they, I think that's something they said. Any, well, let me go, just move on. The church, then, is made up of revolutionaries. We're made up of revolutionaries. We've had a revolution that has happened within us. We believed upon Jesus, and, and, and our lives were changed. And, and we are called to be revolutionary messengers in the world that, that exists beyond us. And, and we see that as Jesus speaks to this dude by the name of Peter. Now, Peter, you know, you wouldn't have named him and voted him most likely to succeed. But Jesus looks at Peter one day and says, I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of, of, of uh, hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is speaking to Peter, and he's saying, Peter, you're undergoing a revolution, and you will be a revolutionary. And I want to tell you something. God is at work here at Village. The Holy Spirit is moving with power in the hearts of God's people right here. And as we learn to walk in the Spirit and lift up the name of Jesus, and as we're totally dependent upon the Father for every good and perfect gift, we will see the Almighty move upon us more and more and more. And that's what happens when we are kingdom-focused. In turn, our church is becoming kingdom-focused, and, and we're living and we're serving a risen Savior. And when Jesus arrived on the scene, this is what he declared. He said, the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. You know, last night and yesterday afternoon, there's a lot of different young men running up and down football fields with helmets on and pads. 
And they started off those games with time on the clock. And the time ticked down. The first quarter was over, and the second quarter was over, and the, second, the first half was over, and then the third, and then the fourth. The time was fulfilled, and it was what it was. It wasn't pretty, though. Jesus said the time is fulfilled. Now, what we need to understand in that, when you look at biblical prophecy, the times are fulfilled. Jesus came at the, at the most perfect of time to identify with humanity. And the times are fulfilled today. Every major prophecy concerning the return of Jesus Christ has been fulfilled. Jesus could come at any time. He could come at any moment. The woman of Samaria said, we're looking for Messiah. Well, we can say we're looking for Messiah as well. And Jesus goes on after he tells them the time is fulfilled. And he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of me, and I'm going to make you revolutionary. The time's fulfilled. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And Mark uses the terminology of immediately over and over again. Now, he's writing to a Roman audience, and, and the Romans are, are very interested in things moving and getting on with it. You know, it's kind of like when somebody's telling you, uh, a, a short story and a long version. You're just wanting them to kind of move along. But, but Mark, you know, he, he's kind of, let's move on with some immediacy. But what I notice here, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. You know, these disciples didn't postpone their obedience. They did it immediately. Now, I opened up in, in, uh, this morning in, in that text where Jesus said, I say to you that whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Now get this. Jesus did miracles, and Jesus walked on water, and Jesus raised people from the dead. He did all kinds of things while he was on earth as a display of his authority that had been vested in him by the Father and empowered in him through the Holy Spirit. Now, he's telling us we're going to go out and do greater things. Jesus was inaugurating the kingdom of God, but he's also unleashing the authority and the power of God in us and through his church. And if we're going to be a kingdom-focused people, and in turn, a kingdom-focused kind of church, then as a part of our church, you know, we have to, go, to come to the place where we are walking in sync with the Father. Yesterday, I was out running, and I don't know how I got this in my head. I don't know why it came into my head, but I, I was thinking about a marching cadence. Any of you ever do that? You know, hoop, two, three, four. You know, I got that in my head. I, it, oh, that goes all the way to basic training back when I was 18 years old. I don't know why that got in my head. But I remember we marched an awful lot. And we had to be in sync. When we have the honor guard come in here for special days, man, those guys are in sync. They're in lockstep. And that's what the Lord's calling upon us to be with Him. He's calling upon us to be in lockstep with Him because, you see, you know, we're never called to do work for God. We're simply called to work with God. You know, you're, you can't be good enough. You can't work hard enough. You cannot do enough to please God. The only way you please God is when you get in on God's agenda and you follow Him and what He's doing as He invites you. Because you see, the work of God is this. It's God unleashing Himself. Unleashing Himself to us and through us and all around us. And so a kingdom person and a kingdom-focused church is a church that exists to transform unbelievers into Christ-like believers and, and to mature these believers into kingdom multipliers of the message of Jesus Christ. So, how do you recognize a kingdom-focused church? Because, I mean, there's a lot of churches all around us. 
And man, there are different kinds of churches. How many of you have ever been to different kinds of churches? I mean, types. You know, I had two cousins that were Nazarene preachers. And I remember as a kid, you know, uh, this cousin would come into town and preach at, I think we only had one Nazarene church. And so my dad would load us up and we'd go over to the Nazarene church. That's the only time we went to a different church when I was a kid. You know, uh, basically it was when the cousin came to town and when he was preaching revival and we'd go hear him preach. And they had hard pews too. Or when perhaps we went out of town and I had some other cousins that were primitive Baptist. Anybody ever heard of primitive Baptist? Now, those primitive Baptist churches are a little bit different than us. Some of them have music and, you know, piano, and some of them don't. But they're, they're different. And, uh, you know, the Catholic Church is somewhat different than us. Some mornings on that long run, I'll, I'll swing through, I think it's Resurrection down there, run their parking lot and come back out. That, you know, that can add up to an extra mile from the, where I turn off to go up that way. And, and, and I'm always impressed uh, they have that, I, I think, that, is it Mass every morning? What is that they do every morning? Mass. Man, there's always people there. There may not be but three or four, but those same three or four are there every day. And, and they do things a little bit different. And where was I going with this? So what does a church look like that's kingdom focused? How do you recognize it? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Well, Well, you know... We, as we talk about Jesus and the story of the Samaritan woman, here's just a little bit of a peek into it. Jesus has just finished that, that encounter with the, the Samaritan woman. And uh, she said, sir, you know, you, you must be a prophet because, you know, you're telling me stuff that nobody else knows about. And, you know, she was a woman. She had passion for life. She had a, a passion that hadn't drowned out. It hadn't ended. Uh, you know, she had been in multiple broken and failed relationships. But, you know, she still wanted to live. And, and Jesus met her right where she was and met her right where her needs were. And so this woman, we read in John chapter 4, verse 28, she left her water jar and she went away into town and said to the people come see a man who told me all that I ever did can this be the Christ and they went out of town and they were coming to him now the disciples are coming back because Jesus had sent them he said listen guys I'm a little bit hungry we've been walking we've been traveling and uh, go into town and get us some food and bring it back. And so they come back, and, and, uh, and, and we read that they're urging him in verses 31 and 32, you know, saying, Rabbi, eat. But then Jesus says, you know, after they say, Rabbi, eat, he says, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So now they're a little bit confused. Now, here all these people are coming from town. Here's this woman saying, can this be the Christ? He's told me everything about my life. Here the disciples are. They've gone as Jesus had, has, has commanded them and gone and gotten food and brought it back. But now Jesus is saying, I have food that you don't know about. There's some confusion going on. And, and, and Jesus begins to give us insight into what the nature of the kingdom of God is really about. And what we gather is that the kingdom of God is as real as you are and as I am, and it's all centered in what God is doing. Jesus says, I have food that you don't know about. Listen to verse 34. He said, and my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields. They're white for harvest. I was noticing Friday night, I was driving uh, back into town from Montgomery, and I don't know, it was probably 10 o'clock at night, and, and as my lights hit those cotton fields north of Baker, that cotton was just glowing white. You know, it's white, it's ready for harvest. He said, Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here uh, the saying holds true, one seeps, uh, sows and other reaps. I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. 
So what Jesus is really telling us about the kingdom, you got these crowds coming out of town. Okay, we got this woman that's telling us there's a man out here that's telling us her everything that she's ever done that nobody ever knows about except a few of us in the gossip, in the gossip circle. He's got the disciples who are following immediately. They're bringing back food. And Jesus is saying, I've got food that you don't even know about. It's to do the will of the Father. So what Jesus is telling us is he's telling us his kingdom of God is about a ministry of dynamic, powerful reclamation. It's what God is doing in our world today. He is reclaiming territory. He's reclaiming the territory of the human heart. Because when Jesus comes in to live in you, in that process of reclamation, there's that revolution. God reclaims that heart. He reclaims that life for His honor, for His glory, for eternity. That had been lost to sin, that had been lost to rebellion, that had been lost to failure, that had been lost to brokenness, that had been lost to all these different things kinds of things the kingdom of God is the reign of God in our lives as those who follow Jesus Christ so when Jesus comes to live in you he comes not only to be your savior but he comes to be your lord he comes to rule over us and because he rules over us he begins to work and to manifest himself in that rule and in that relationship and in that righteousness that we have And so when Jesus enters our lives, we can declare that there's been some awesome changes that have occurred. And you know, before we know Christ, we have all kinds of pressure, don't we? A pressure to perform, a pressure to be, a pressure to succeed. And out of that, we get driven, we get overbooked, we get um, overtaxed. We get worn out, we trip up, we fall down, all those different kinds of things. But when Jesus comes to rule in us, it happens because of this thing called grace. Now, grace is an interesting concept because grace, you know, the, the, the theological dictionary definition of grace is the free and the unmerited favor of God as manifested in salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. That's the official Short definition. And then, in this long section on grace in the Dictionary of Theology, it goes on and says, The doctrine of grace, though, pertains to God's activity rather than to His nature. Now, when we talk about the nature of God, we want to say our God is a gracious God. That's all cool. But God is not just gracious in his makeup. God is gracious to you. He's gracious to me. He's gracious to us. He's gracious in his behavior, in his nature, in his activity, in your heart and life. You following me? You with me? So in that process, what we find is the pressure's off. I don't have to work to please God. Remember Paul said, For by grace are we saved through faith, not that of ourselves, that no man should boast. You know, I don't have to work. All I have to be is to be. The pressure's been lifted off. And and when the pressure's off, you know, uh, we can can see God. And and we can see God is always at work. And when we see God is always at work, you know what God is doing? He is inviting us to join Him. You know, we don't have to be sitting there thinking of a new ministry or thinking of a new event or doing all these different kinds of things to be pleasing to God. All we have to be is, is alert and aware through His grace working in us, because kingdom focus brings us to a complete, absolute dependence upon God. So how is that expressed? How is it expressed in the life of the individual, and how is kingdom focus uh, church expressed? You know what the official title of this church is? 
I mean, some people call us village. Some people call us Village Baptist Church. Some people call us Steve's Church, Pastor Steve's Church. It's not my church. Some people call us the church or village church, whatever else. Our official title is Village Baptist Church of Destin, Inc. That's what it says in our uh, Department of State paperwork and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and that's simply saying we are a particular congregation. Because, you know, there's other village churches out there. Did you know that? A few years ago, I had a church member call me up one Saturday afternoon. It was uh, about 6 o'clock, and he said, I came to the church, and there's nobody here. And I said, why? He said, well, I went online, and I bought tickets for that concert. I said, what concert? Some concert. And he said, well, the concert's supposed to be, you know, at this time. And I said, which website? And he said, well, the Village Baptist Church website. I said, which Village Baptist Church? He didn't go to Village Baptist Church of Destiny, Inc. He was here in, in, um, in Destin, Florida, and he bought tickets for Village Baptist Church of something Washington. He missed the concert. So, you know, we're identified. We are a unique kind of people right here. And so this church, our church, is the church that God has put us in right now. How many of you know that you're in Village Church this morning? You know that. You're helping me now. Because, wow, I've got to cover a lot of territory. I've got to get a 98-yard run down right now. I've got just a few minutes to do it. So, you know, God thinks... This is what God thinks. You, many of you are, are a part of the committed uh, that have chosen, that have, that have been led here, and this is where God's put you. God thinks that you're the best person in the world for village right now. It's not, you know, uh, the church is not made up just of its pastors, but the church is made up of the people. And that means, you know, that we all belong together right here, every one of us. Some of us speak English. Some of us speak Brazilian. Some people come in here and they speak Russian or Ukrainian or, or Thai or Laotian. But God has brought us all together. And right now, this morning, this is what God says we need. It's a high calling, and it's a high calling to a high life of labor in God. And when you and when I become people of the kingdom, God wants us to pour our hearts into the church that he has given us. You know, many of you poured your hearts into the game yesterday or whatever team you were cheering for. You poured your hearts in. But you know what? You were all in the stadium or in front of the television set. You were an observer. You were a cheerleader. But God has called you onto the playing field. He's called every single one of us into service. Tonight we have a volunteer appreciation banquet over at the Henderson. And, um, you know, it's, it's honoring all of you as volunteers. We've got 170 people that signed up to come. We would open it up and say, you know, we can accept a few more, but we, we can't this year. Maybe by next year we can, accept, you know, we, we'll get everybody signed up that failed to get signed up. But it's to simply say thank you to that 170. But I know there's a few more volunteers than that, but God has called all of us to be servants. When you become a kingdom person, God wants you to pour your heart into his church. And here's the reality check. The kingdom of God in its simplest form is the reign of Jesus Christ as the Lord of lords and as the King of kings in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit working in us and working through us and working around us in such a way that we are actually living and doing the will of God. The kingdom of God can live in the lives of God's people. So that kingdom of God living in us is, is, uh, is about vision. It's about being focused Kingdom focus. It's about having 2020 vision. And when I say 2020 vision, you know, one side of the 20 is vertical. The other side of the 20 is horizontal. And when we talk about, you know, vertical um, vision, we're talking about a vertical relationship with the Father. All that stuff I talked about in opening up this message. And it means that because I have that vertical relationship where I have trusted Christ and I am seated in Christ, it means that, you know, I participate 
in His work, and I proclaim His truth, and I focus on the Father, and I serve the Father. Well, you know what we call that here at Village? We call that loving God. Remember, don't you see that on your bulletins? Help me. Look at your bulletin right now. Tell me what it says. Front cover. Love God, be real, bring hope. So we're loving God. It's about that vertical relationship. Yeah, you know, we love God. We lift up our hands in worship. We fall on our faces before Him. But if I'm really loving God, it has a lot more to do with, uh, with uh, than just standing in worship on a given Sunday morning. It has with falling before Him and serving Him as He's working in me, through me, and around me. And understanding He's inviting me to join that work that He's given now, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So, he's talking then about a horizontal relationship that we have. And that horizontal relationship, because we have the vertical, our horizontal is called loving, uh, not only uh, is called being real and bringing hope. And in that being real, you know, what we have is, is, you know, we're building each other up through discipleship groups, through small groups of studies, through service, and, and, and we're building one another up by, by walking with one another in, in times of grief and sorrow and sickness and pain. We are walking in real relationship with one another horizontally. And beyond that, we're walking in such a way as to bring hope to the world beyond us. You know, when I got that phone call message this week, go and see so-and-so, I said, how did you choose me? You know, I'm always curious. You know, somebody's in the down and outs, and I've never seen them in church. I've barely gotten a hand wave out of them as I've passed them in town. How did you pick me? I mean, why, why didn't you pick one of the other two dozen pastors around here? How did you pick me? Because my uncle told me to get a hold of the nearest man of God I knew and to hang on. And I felt like I knew you because you waved at me. So when I'm bringing hope, it's not only about knocking on a door and somebody coming in and you saying, hey, if you were to die tonight, do you know that you'd go to heaven? What would you say to God? You know, a hard sell approach. Oftentimes that bringing hope is about building a relationship of trust with other people so that we can begin to walk with them so as to see that radical, revolutionary reclamation process happen in their lives as they come into a relationship with God and God's working in them and through them and around them. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what we're called to be. So we can't, we can't be navel gazers. You know what navel gazers do? They sit in their little circle and they're all looking down. And they occasionally look up, but they're gazing at their navel. Man, I got a cute navel. I like my navel. I saw the Babylon Bee, I think it was. It's a jokester Twitter thing. Uh, there's a picture of um, he wrote radical David Platt thank you on a mountaintop in Brazil and he had his baseball cap on backwards the Babylon Bee said alert there's a southern Baptist church with a called emergency business meeting going on today discussing baseball caps on backwards. It was just being a joke. But what it's really saying is so many times we get focused on the small stuff. I don't care which way you wear your cap. What I care about is your relationship with Christ. And our focus is to be upon God 
but it's to be upon others as we encourage each other. And in encouraging each other, we're reaching out to others to bring the good news of the revolution of reclamation into their lives. And so it's called being real. It's called bringing hope. And, and, and God, you know, in the, in the local church is working in a mighty way. The local church is simply this. It's people standing in relationship with God, standing in relationship with each other, and staying in a relationship with the world beyond us. Jesus said in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. You know, that's what we're to be about. We're to be about walking in total and complete obedience. And the Great Commission is the key to understanding what God is doing in our world at this very moment. So here we are. We're here to love God. We're here to bring hope, uh, to be be real and to, to bring hope. And that leads us to the kingdom-focused church at work. What are we doing as we do that? Well, Paul puts it this way. He says, we're rejoicing, we are praying, and we're giving thanks. Isn't that amazing? We're rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks. That's how we focus. First Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. We're people that are centered upon the Word. Second Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the Word of truth. We're encouraging people. Therefore, encourage one another. Man, we're to encourage one another. You know, that, that verse tells me that I'm to lift you up. It tells me that you're to lift me up. We're to encourage one another. But encouragement is not always just about lifting us up. It's also about correcting us and helping us to see things better. Encouragement. And then we're making. And back to Matthew 28. It's about making disciples. Go therefore. Because of what God has done in you. Therefore, because of that revolution that took place in you. Therefore, because you have been reclaimed for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. A few weeks ago, I asked you to write down one thing. Who remembers what it was? Somebody unsaved, and you began to pray for them. And ask God to... Make a way. So here here we are. We're at the make a way part. Go, therefore, and make disciples of that person from whatever nation they're from. Helping them come to the knowledge of truth where they're, they're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Telling them about the Lord. You know this fellow that I talked to the other day? I mean, you know, there's a lot of easy answers. But, you know, those easy answers had not provided the results in his life that he needed to be set free. And he said, I know I could go back to this, I'm saying, but when you go back to that, you know, that's kind of the, the, uh, the definition of stupidity. Because, you know, doing the, the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, that's called what? Insanity. I said, the only way that you're going to come to know freedom and life is in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And man, we throw out all kinds of excuses in that. Ah. I'm a Baptist. Well, that's great but you still need to know Jesus Christ. Or I'm Catholic. That's great, but you still need to know Jesus Christ. It's not the religion. It's not how I work. It's the relationship that God has bestowed upon me through His Son, Jesus Christ, in that He came and He paid the debt that I couldn't pay. And He gave me His righteousness. 
And he took on my sin. And he overcame it. That's what matters. So I go, I go there for and I reach the nations. And this is what I know. I know that as I'm going, Jesus said, I am with you. He doesn't say, I'm just with you when you're awake. You know, the Bible says, a verse I skipped earlier, but the Bible says he neither slumbers nor sleeps. God, he's never on break. He never's having to sit down. He's never having to, to take a nap. He's always there. And Jesus says, I am with you. Till when? The end of the age. But the time is fulfilled, the Bible tells us. And that end of the age could be at any time, at any moment. And, call, and it therefore calls for immediate action on our part. So what's God speaking into your life today? What's he calling you to commit your life to in his plan and in his purpose? Because, you know, we've all got unique gifts. How's God plugging you into his church here at Village? As we've, after we pray, we're going to sing a song. And maybe there's some of you that never got connected to God through Christ alone. And you're wanting to say, Pastor, I want to trust Jesus today to be the Savior and the Lord of my life. Some of you are ready to commit in membership to this church. Some of you have a prayer concern. Some of you have a commitment that you need to make the Lord through baptism. You're, you're a professing believer in Christ, but you've never been baptized biblically. Or who knows, maybe God's calling somebody to, to be a preacher of the gospel. Or to be a student pastor. Or to be a missionary somewhere. What's God speaking into your life today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. For this day, we thank you for the time that you've given us here today. We pray, O oh God, that you'd work mightily in our hearts and our lives as we stand and walk in commitment unto you. Father, help us to be focused upon your kingdom, to be focused upon you and you at work in and through our lives. And Lord, help us in that focus to be obedient with a heart of immediate action. To you be the glory, both now and throughout all of eternity. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you come today? He's a beautiful Savior. He's a wonderful Lord. He's calling you.